Thank you so much for joining us today for what is going to be a very important and exciting discussion. Um, my name is Holly Russin Gilman. I'm a Civic Innovation Fellow here at New America. And this is an exciting panel brought to you by the Political Reform Project, um, which is run by Mark Schmidt and Lee Drutman over here, who have been instrumental in putting this event together. So I'm going to do quick bios on our panelists, and then we'll let them talk and have an exciting discussion, and then we'll open it up for Q&A in a few minutes. So um, we have uh, Professor Bruce Kane, who is a professor of the humanities and social sciences at UC Berkeley. Stanford. Stanford. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, Mark, why don't you continue the introductions? <laughs> Sorry, oh, all right. Actually, right. it's, it's legitimate to be confused yeah. because I wasn't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, one correction, and I and <laughs> I, get, I get drafted. <laughs> Well, I'm th again, thank you all for being here today. I'm Mark Schmidt. Um, the the core of this discussion is 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 uh, Bruce Kane's book, Democracy More or Less, um, which is an exam the really broad ranging examination of kind of some of the quandaries and paradoxes of political reform across a across a whole range of of of, of areas. As Holly said. He's a professor at Stanford, formerly the director of the University of California Center at DC. And I think a lot of us know him as kind of the, you know, the expert on things going on in California, particularly around the initiative process. And that's, what, that's where we very often uh, uh, see his name. Uh, to my uh, right, Francis Lee is a, is a political scientist at the University of Maryland and uh, the author of a, of a book on, uh, pr on partisanship in the Senate. Um, and really one of the leading political scientists studying Congress. Um, uh, to, to her right, John Lawrence uh, worked in Congress for a number of years that's cut off here, but a long time for uh, Congressman George Miller and, uh, and Speaker Pelosi, two of, uh, two of my favorites, and for the last two years has been teaching at the uh, University of California Center here himself. Uh, Perry Bacon Jr. is a political journalist at NBC. He's also a, a New America Fellow, uh, studying the, some of the, the uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Care Act in the States, um, and previously worked with the Washington Post and Time Magazine, um, and uh, I think that's it. So I, what we'd like to do, Bruce, if you want to come up here, and then we'll do the rest of the discussion from the seats. Oh, okay. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you very much to the New America Foundation and to uh, Lee and Mark in particular for organizing this, and to the few of the brave and the hardy who have showed up. <laughs> um, a bunch of us, or at least three of us, were at the uh, FEC hearing yesterday that was written about this morning in uh, Dana Milbank's column. And um, what was interesting, of course, the column was about how the public comment section, which happened after we left, became a spectacle of, should we say, unusual views uh, and um, what he regarded as kind of uh, surprisingly unmeasured and undeliberative conversation and full of eccentric people. And uh, in reality, that actually encapsulate one of the problems, one of the many problems that we have to deal with in contemporary democracy, that is our faith that the public will save us, or the public's faith in themselves <laughs> to actually save us, which comes up in a lot of different contexts. And so the term, or the, the title of the book, Democracy More or Less, is about the fact that you can't give up on the public, you can't give up on the task of trying to encourage better civic education, of finding constructive ways to engage the public, but the reality is that all too many times our idealistic notion of what citizenship is has led to a series of mistakes in political reform that we keep repeating over and over again. Now, again, I don't mean to say that there isn't a role for public opinion or there isn't a role for direct democracy or, or for public comment period or for transparency. Um, it, it rather, what we're trying to say, I think, uh, what I'm trying to say in the book and I, what I think a lot of scholars have been trying to say in political science is that there are limits to this and that we need to sort of think very seriously about when to turn on the instruments of uh, public input and when to uh, allow for representative democracy and for pluralism to flourish. So let me just summarize some of the basic themes 
and then take some examples that relate to issues in Congress, which I think was our orientation here, um, and then uh, I'll try to do this all within 10 minutes or 15 minutes so that we can hear what other people have to say. Um, the first theme, I think, in my book is that there have been some notable improvements in political reform. There, it's silly to say that the system isn't better than it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. But the reality is that the progress in some areas, such as the expansion of the franchise, uh, is offset in some ways by issues that just continually frustrate us. And I think of campaign finance reform, or I think of lobbying reform, or I think of uh, redistricting forms, issues that if you've been around as long as I have, the conversation now isn't that much different from what it was 30 years ago. I mean, it's taken, it takes a slightly different form, but it seems like we're stuck in the mud, that we're cycling around. And some of these issues do cycle because of fads, but some of them cycle because we keep making the same damn mistake over and over again. Um, so some aspects of political reform have been disappointing. In some areas, uh, we see that the political reform issues are very different from in other areas. So if you're living in California or you're living in states that have strong direct democracy traditions, uh, you can see that change is easy to achieve and therefore the kinds of mistakes and problems that you have are very different from the ones at the federal government level where it's very hard to make changes uh, because the Constitution requires supermajority votes at both the state level and at the congressional level uh, because the politics is just much more visible and the money is much more concentrated. You get down to the state and local level, you see very different issues where we try lots of experiments. Some of them lead to problems of excessive democracy. So. What I try to say in the book is that it's, it's a mistake to say political reform is one big issue. Rather, it's three different types of issues and many uh, specific examples within them. There are the problems of too much democracy, where we literally try too hard to include the public, and, and a lot of direct democracy problems come out of that. Uh, there are issues of too little democracy. Uh, think of the NSA. Think of accountability issues, particularly around foreign affairs. Uh, where we just haven't quite figured out how to get accountability, but at the same time preserve the ability of the country to engage in foreign policy in an effective way. And then we have issues of cycles, that is to say, where we keep changing our mind. And uh, examples that I give in the book are between legislative and executive power. We, we go back and forth as to uh, how we want um, to balance that off, sometimes depending upon where you are in power. So. Democrats, when they're in power, uh, if they control all the branches of government, hate the filibuster, but when they're out of power, they like the filibuster. And uh, it's Republicans, too, of course. So there isn't just one issue. Uh, populist assumptions tend to fail when citizens don't live up to the expectations that we have for them. What voters want is essentially a fire al alarm system of accountability. That is to say, they don't want to have to pay attention most of the time, and they don't. They don't want to really inform themselves, but when they're pissed off, they want to be able to pull the fire alarm. And so the problem is we set up lots of fire alarms at the state level. There are you know, lots of elected offices and special district level at the state level. Uh, there are initiative measures that uh, either overturn policies or create new policies. Um, in various sorts of ways, we set up all these accountability mechanisms. In reality, voters most of the time don't show up for a lot of these things, right? The turnout in uh, off-year elections, the turnout at all these hearings that we create for environmental laws is minuscule, usually captured by special interests. And so the question is, why aren't the citizens there? Why are they allowing all the special interests to get there? Well, because they got other things to do with their lives, thank you very much, right? They don't have time to monitor all these things. They just want the fire alarm. They want to be able to pull the fire alarm. And the problem with fire alarm democracy is that if you're not pulling the fire alarm, other people who really care will and will pay attention and use these opportunities, these democratic opportunities, whether it's public comment period, uh, which we saw yesterday, or whether it's uh, FOIA laws, or whether it's uh, opportunities to vote for everybody from dog catcher to president. Uh, these opportunities are not captured by the general public in many instances. They're captured by um, uh, 
small segments. And I've become particularly interested, I was telling Francis, in the way an environmental laws are, are uh, implemented at the state level. And there is no better example of that or the water problems that John and I have talked about periodically than the capture by interest groups of opportunities that were created in the name of the public. Um, so I argue in there the, what's missing there is the kind of pluralist uh, uh, understanding that when the public doesn't show up in great numbers, interested intermediaries do. And we kind of walked away from this uh, about 20 years ago because we, we, we didn't really figure out a way to correct these biases in the way stakeholder democracy works or intermediary, intermediary democracy works or indeed party democracy works. And that, I think, is part of the agenda that we have to look at as we, as we move forward. Uh, and lastly, in terms of general points, and then I'll just give four examples and quit. Uh, and that is that uh, I've sat on charter commissions and state constitutional commissions, and there's a tendency for us eggheads, and I, by definition, if you're here, you're an egghead, uh, to think of rational consistency as what you want in political reform. And the reality is that we have to go back to the, the fact that the system that we set up right from the start is not built on consistency of any one principle such as populism or power to the people, but rather on complementarity between interest groups, parties and intermediaries, between public opinion and between neutral expertise. And you have advocates in the legal profession that think the court should be doing everything because they're the neutral referee and you get people uh, that aren't very democratic, that don't want to have the public involved at all, and you've got people that want to be super democratic, but really the reform task is how to blend these things in complementary ways. And to be honest, it's never finished. It's a, it's a case of adaptive mitigation. That is to say, every time we fix something, it'll get unfixed and you got to fix it again. So that's just what we need to realize. So let me just talk about uh, four examples of where this bites us in the butt uh, when it comes to the Congress. Number one, is the primary system. The primary system was supposed to bring in voters and allow them to democratize the party choice process. And um, as the Democratic Party learned very early when they, after the, uh, the McGovern campaign, and uh, party activists tend to prefer purity. And every study in political science shows that the people that show up at conventions, the people that show up at caucuses, and the people that show up at low turnout elections are generally more ideological than the people that show up in general elections or the people that don't show up at all. So that's a problem. So when you go about trying to think, well, I'll have an open primary or I'll have a top two primary, if the people don't show up, it doesn't matter what the mechanism is. And so we're discovering in California, despite all the tinkering that we do with that, if you don't change the turnout, you don't really change the outcome. If it's mainly the people that care and are more ideological that they're there, it doesn't matter what rule you're going to have. You know, you might determine which of those groups is going to win, but you're not going to moderate the process. So, you know, if you think about Boehner's problem right now, or you think of the Tea Party, uh, and no doubt the time will come again when the Democratic Party has to deal with this struggle, uh, you see that uh, the notion that somehow the process would be representative and it would be uh, democratized, really, again, it's the capture by the, by the purists. Or if you think of, in campaign finance reform, the cult of the individual donor, which is the central premise of so much political reform. Well, first of all, one of the things we're discovering now with an increasing number of papers is that the individual donors are actually more partisan than the institutional donors in many instances. And so it's not clear that if your problem is over partisanship that you really want to be encouraging small donors. But that aside, the reality is that uh, most people don't either have the means or the motivation to give money. <laughs> the reality is that far fewer of them give money than even bother to vote and far fewer Americans vote than in many other democracies. So, uh, you know, the cult of the small individual donors, I think, is at the source, and I'd have to explain this a little bit further, of our problems with respect to campaign finance reform and the rise of independent expenditures. Um, thirdly, uh, basically the undesigned nature of lobbying, uh, which fills the expertise ga gap for uh, Congress. It, it's too, too many times we're trying, the, the, the hope is to sort of regulate or control or diminish the role of lobbyists rather than recognize that lobbyists en en have an important role, intermediary role, and we have to figure out how to balance that off against the potential for unequal influence and, and corruption. And uh, 
and uh, part of it is not accepting the fact that uh, we really have to realize that lobbyists have a, a, a critical role in the system. We should be designing it to be more fair, not to, to hope that it will go away. And then lastly, let me just finish the new democratic opportunities fallacy. That is that if we create all these public comment periods for regulations, that somehow bureaucracies will do a better job of being responsive to the people. Well, guess what? First of all, People that are trained to be in bureaucracies don't really have political skills. They don't know how to balance off competing goals. Their job is to implement some law that Congress has given them. So what if you create four or five environmental laws, you give them to different agencies, and you don't give a priority over those different agent, you know, over those different goals, you leave it to the local jurisdictions and the agents, uh, the the agencies officials to figure out how to balance flood control with Endangered Species Act, with conservation laws, with recreation use. You know, they don't know how to do it and there's no prioritization. So uh, again, when we create these public opportunities for comment and for participation, we assume the general public would be there and rarely do they uh, show up. So uh, I will stop there because I think my point is simply that uh, th we've made some mistakes over and over again and it's time to really think in a more uh, creative way of, uh, uh, of approaching reform so that we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I, I I'll start the conversation and I think we'll be, we'll be brief in our, in, our, in our comments. I found this fascinating. I'm somebody who holds almost all of those fallacies and still holds them uh, strongly. Uh, it, I, I, you know, some of you were here last week, we were talking about small donors and, uh, and, and some of the other issues. But I found the, you know, this book, uh, as well as some other things that, that have been written over the, over the last few, few years that kind of challenge a lot of the kind of truisms of, 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 uh, of political reform to be extremely important. And, uh, and, I, and I think it, it can, it should inform everyone's uh, everyone's thinking, um, and there's a lot in here that's really valuable. And I hope as we go on, you know, as we go a little further, Bruce, you'll talk a little bit about kind of where you see the solution and wh and what you know what you call your neo pluralist approach, um, because to me, uh, I like it. I feel like what's missing is a recognition of just how far off we are. For, you know, it's not like you can say. Get, get rid of those illusions of political reform and let the system go. Because we're not in a good place, and we're not in a place where I think, I think what, what's striking to me is there's so, fire alarms or not, there's so little of the feedback that one expects to see in a political process right now. Um, so for example, uh, you, you talk about a little bit in the book and, and, and others in your kind of school of thought often talk about, well, if we brought back earmarks, that would be great because then you know, there, there'd be, you know, uh, members of Congress would be able to, you, you know, the, the speaker and others, the Appropriations Committee would have a greater hold on members and, uh, and, and, and because members want to deliver stuff to their district and getting rid of those was a mistake. Well, I look at it and I think, well, the interesting thing is these members of Congress didn't want the earmark. They said, we don't need that. You know, you had members of Congress saying, we're not going to help constituents if they have problems with the ACA. They can call the White House. We're not helping. You know, to see members of congressional offices, I mean, it's probably astonishing, as people who've worked on the Hill, a congressional office saying, we're not doing constituent service doesn't happen. Um, you have governors able to say, we're rejecting billion dollar infrastructure projects, and there's no electoral consequences to doing that. So, you know, you, you get to the point where there's, uh, I think, between money and identity politics and a bunch of other things going on, there's a big shift in our politics so that just to get to the kind of pluralist uh, approach where, yeah, you accept some trade off you accept that there's earmarks, you accept that local interests prevail over some idealized version of the, of, of the national public interest, you know, you could accept that. Just to get there is a political reform project. So I think that, I think that in a way, I look at this, I hope it can be seen as not just a critique of the fallacies of political reform, some of which I'm going to hold on to, um, but as, a, as a, a little bit of a, of a more realistic agenda for what reform should look like and do. And I, and, I, and I agree, it's not, the agenda shouldn't be that we imagine, you know, this idyllic world where every citizen is spending, you know, five hours a day reading about the issues that are important to them and setting their priorities. That's, that's not, that's not somewhere we're go where we're going to get. But I, I, think we, I think we have further to go from where we are than I, than I, I think 
some of what uh, w some of your book suggests. Anyway. <laughs> What's that? You, are you turning to me? I'm turning to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I appreciate the chance to be here to participate in this discussion of uh, Bruce Cain's important new book. I'll just say what I, what I most appreciate about the book is, is its wisdom. This is not the uh, first quality that usually comes to mind when you, uh, when you read the political reform genre that tends towards overclaiming and uh, oversimplification. From the outset, the book recognizes the difficult trade-offs involved in reform efforts, the irreducible fact of competing goods. Um, two other highlights of the book. It gives us a framework for thinking about the big picture of political reform. It's very easy to get lost in the weeds of uh, the details of institutional reform proposals, you know, the areas of campaign finance and redistricting and legislative procedure and ethics reforms. These are extremely complex issue areas. Uh, what uh, the book gives us is some useful ways to classify various reforms and think theoretically about what we're trying to achieve with them. At the same time, the book is also impressive for its range. Uh, it's difficult for any analyst to develop expertise in any one of those issue areas, but Bruce Kane is clearly conversant with them all. Um, the goal in the book is to tread a path between too much democracy and too little democracy. That's why the title of the book is Democracy More or Less. Um, he differentiates his approach, neo-pluralism, from the populist tradition um, and from the apolitical tradition. So um, the populist tradition, things like um, term limits, more elections, uh, initiative referenda, and the apolitical tradition that wants to empower uh, uh, you know, expert agencies or the courts or, um, uh, non or use nonpartisan elections. As someone who studies American institutions and spends much of my time reading about and writing about the Congress, it's probably not surprising that I'm very sympathetic uh, with this book's outlook. Uh, the emphasis on the importance and the, unav and the unavoidability of mediating institutions. Uh, strikes me as the right place to begin in thinking about American democracy. But rather than comment on the specific reform agenda laid out in the book, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the politics of political reform more generally. And it seems to me that the biggest hurdle that a neo-pluralist um, reform agenda faces is public skepticism. Public trust in government, as well as in just about any mediating institution, one can find data on right now is extremely low. After 2010, trust in government overall has been plumbing record depths in the history of public opinion polling. The same is true of approval of Congress as an institution, which according to the most recent Gallup poll stands at 16 percent. It hasn't exceeded 30 percent since 2007. Public attitudes towards both major political parties are also very poor by historical standards. According to Pew Research Center polls, a majority of the American public hasn't had a favorable attitude towards the Republican Party since 2004, when it was at 52 percent. The Republican Party currently stands at 41 percent approval. Attitudes towards the Democratic Party are only somewhat better, uh, 46 percent. This is a far cry from the 60 percent approval ratings that the party used to routinely get in the 1990s. Um, Americans' confidence in the news media also stands at or tied with record lows in Gallup polling. Public views of labor unions since 2010 stand at historic lows. Uh, huge shares of Americans, 75 percent or more, believe that interest groups have too much influence. The bottom line is that any reformer arguing for the importance of mediating institutions in such an environment is going to run into tremendous headwinds of public mistrust. It's probably not surprising that pluralism as a school of thought had its heyday in the 1950s and 1960s when trust in all these institutions was much higher than it is today. Instead, this environment of public mistrust offers an advantage to the reform traditions that uh, Bruce Cain wants to steer us away from. Public skepticism of political institutions is most advantageous for those arguing for populist-style reforms. But uh, research by uh, political scientists uh, Hibbing and Tice Morris also shows that Americans are frequently more comfortable with and trusting of apolitical and technocratic decision makers than they are of political and representative institutions. 
Second point I want to make, reflecting on the politics of political reform, is that you have to acknowledge that there are very few voters or groups who really care about these issues primarily because of their desire to adhere to good democratic principles. For example, nobody offers a principled defense of the fact that the residents of Washington, D.C. have no voting representation in Congress. But even as indefensible as the practice is in principle, the only people who care about this issue are the people who are disadvantaged by it, and only some of them do. Democratic principles only cut limited amounts of ice outside of law schools, political science faculties, and reform advocacy organizations. It often seems that the institutional reform arena is one of endless opportunism. On the question of con congressional procedure, it often seems that the two parties simply exchange their talking points when uh, the majority changes hands. The former minority party in the House transitions from denouncing the heavy-handed tactics of the majority to using them in, uh, itself. Watching the debate over the so-called nuclear option uh, in the Senate over judicial nominations, one was struck by the speed with which Democrats moved from defending the unique traditions of the Senate when they were fighting the judicial nominations of George W. Bush to overturning them almost entirely when confirming Obama's nominations. The Republican Party, for its part, went from excoriating Democrats for going nuclear to accepting these new rules and considering perhaps expanding them to, uh, to Supreme Court nominations. It's probably safe to say that major political reforms are generally not adopted on the basis of the, strengths of the, the strength of the arguments in favor of them. Strong arguments help, but they are uh, almost never decisive. When they happen, political reforms are usually adopted because they become common carriers for a diverse group of actors that, uh, who are all persuaded for a variety of reasons that the reforms will help them achieve their goals. For example, Congress's reform era of the 1970s, a period that strengthened central party leaders, weakened uh, congressional uh, uh, committee chairs, and opened up Congress to much greater transparency, only happened because of an array of different interests and individuals coalesced around these institutional reforms as a way to advance their own widely varying goals. Um, the reform coalition got underway because of a frustration with progress on civil rights. Uh, this included legislators like Hubert Humphrey, Eugene McCarthy, Richard Bowling, as well as labor uh, groups, the NAACP, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, and the Americans for Democratic Action. Liberals were the first to get on the reform bandwagon. And their primary target were those Southern committee chairs who'd seemingly had a lock on the process. And they believed that those reforms would help them advance their policy goals. Over time, they were joined by newer reformers, including interest groups like Common Cause and uh, public interest groups more generally, legislators like Gary Hart and Tim Wirth, who sought congressional reform less to advance those traditional liberal goals um, than to reduce corruption and to improve congressional performance and uh, transparency and accountability. But those reforms would probably never have happened simply on the basis of the actors who cared primarily about pro those performance values or any abstract principles of democracy. Critical and decisive energy coalesced around those reforms because they were seen as vital for achieving immediate tangible goals. That energy is strikingly absent in the contemporary Congress. For an institution in which morale is as low as it is on both sides of the aisle, it's notable how little reform ferment there is underway. There's nothing like the engagement with institutional reform issues that one saw in the Congress of the 1970s or even in the mid-1990s. So as we consider the various proposals uh, in uh, uh, Kane's reform agenda, or any other reformers for that matter, the key question always is, who will see these reforms as being in their political interests? And who will see these reforms as being adverse to their interests? And as we contemplate the answer to that question, we immediately run up against the problem of party polarization. With two such evenly matched political parties at the national level, reform proposals will always be scrutinized for any whiff of partisan advantage. In a two-party system, anything that advantages one party disadvantages the other. 
this will be, you know, so this, this will be a, a, a major obstacle uh, in political reform as it is across the range of policy issues that uh, come before the Congress. Uh, the current environment is pretty unfavorable to political reform. Uh, if anything, the hurdles in this area, um, because institutional reforms are always cut so close to partisan interests, the hurdles in this area are even higher than on most uh, political issues. Thank you, Francis. Um, before we turn to John, I just want to flag, let's, uh, you know, before we get done, let's put a definition on the term too much democracy uh, and say what we really mean by that. John. Thank you. I'm struck uh, by uh, the discussion of reform that, and what, what, what Francis was mentioning is the cyclical nature of it. Um, back uh, over 100 years ago, George Washington Plunkett, uh, who I think was a mythical figure, but in any event referred to reform as something like a flower that looks beautiful in the morning and then sort of withers uh, later in the, in the, uh, in the day. Uh, and I think that as I look back at a career of almost 40 years in Congress and, and now having had an opportunity to step back and, and uh, regard some of that experience uh, from a more detached point of view, uh, I, I have both the, the I retain the, the strong faith in the congressional system, which uh, I think is shared by a decreasing number of my countrymen. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I also have a skepticism about uh, the effectiveness and, and the durability uh, of reform. Um, I kind of look at ref political reform like the new iPhone. Uh, it, uh, it's going to correct the uh, pre-existing problems with the earlier model, um, but it very often uh, brings with it uh, complications of its own. Uh, many of which, uh, as Bruce and others write about, are the unintended consequences of well-intentioned action, which seems to be a fairly reliable characteristic of, of life in, in, in Congress, born out of both a certain myopia and and, uh, and, but also out of the inability to see around corners and the necessity of legislating through compromise, which prevents some of the clear-cut decision-making that might avoid some of those inadvertent consequences. Bruce mentioned the, the and, and I think France as well, this desire to put decision-making into the hands of bureaucrats, the non-politicized people uh, in the process. And of course, people familiar with how Congress operates know that Congress very often does that on purpose because it's, in a, it's unable to make some of those decisive uh, kinds of uh, clar clear decisions. Uh, and so it throws these decisions over to an agency which is then empowered to implement uh, what is sometimes vague and, and contradictory uh, mandates from, from the Congress. So it's, it's, it's not it's not quite as unanticipated as, as, as one might uh, think, but given the difficulties of legislating, even in good times, it's sort of an invariable part of the, of the legislative process. In the, in the period of time that I worked in Congress, I think there really were three major periods of reform. Um, I arrived in Washington in early 1975, and that was uh, the Watergate class, which I'm currently writing about, um, uh, that actually, class actually arrived uh, not only to implement a series of reforms themselves, but on the heels of a good number of reforms that had been effectuated by the preceding Congress or two, um, including such changes as campaign finance reform, but also the empowerment of subcommittees and, and some checks on some of the arbitrary powers of, of, of committee chairs. Um, and what the, what the class of 74 is probably best known for uh, is the democratization of the institution further by, uh, by weakening to some extent the reliance on automatic seniority, which had overt political motivations because it didn't destroy the seniority system as a whole. It very selectively took out key senior people who were obstructive of political ends, as, as Francis were mentioned, but many other senior people remained uh, in place and and just as obstinate and uh, and to some extent autocratic as they had previously uh, uh, been, the class also put a heavy emphasis on transparency. Um, this notion that that government works best as in in the sunshine, and what we of course have found is is a few things. One one of the examples of transparency, which became 
in, uh, enacted in Congress in the House in 1979 was the, the use of television. Uh, but also uh, the, the earlier efforts to open up the committee deliberative process. People don't remember that as late as the 1960s, most committee meetings were closed. Uh, many committees did not re produce reports. Uh, the floor was closed. There were no recorded votes in the Committee of the Whole where most of the substantive legislative work took place. And so if you lost a vote in the Committee of the Whole, you weren't even able to bring it up for a vote, a recorded vote in the House of Representatives. One of the reasons, incidentally, that so much uh, anger grew uh, over the war in Vietnam because people would bring up uh, bills and uh, amendments if they could uh, in, the, in the Committee of the Whole, lose them, and then be precluded from even bringing them up for a public debate. Uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives. And so this notion was that the more sunshine that shines into the process, the better. Um, but there were many people, including uh, Speaker of the House, Rayburn, who were very reluctant to and, and warned about the downsides of transparency, uh, and particularly about television, television in the, in the, on the floor, that it might produce a generation of performers rather than a generation of legislators. Fortunately, that hasn't happened. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and really diminish the legislative process. But the other piece that, 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 that's occurred is that I think transparency to some extent provides a false sense of security about, about the operations of the political system. Um, we used to have conference committees uh, where House and Senate would come together and, and cut deals. Uh, those were closed too, of course. Uh, then when the public came in and, uh, and you had to operate under transparent rules, what really happened is that the deal simply got cut in, in less uh, obvious places. And so one can be left with a series of rules, but one can reasonably question whether or not it opened the process to, uh, or not, and whether or not it, it, it accomplished the goal, which was simultaneously not simply public review and press review, but also making the political system work better. Um, I think the second period of reform occurred under the Republicans in, in 1995, um, where uh, there were changes made, really significant changes to some of the methods of selecting a chairman. There was obviously a significant change in terms of the, uh, even more so than under Speaker Wright, the accumulation of power in the, in the leadership. Uh, there were other reforms that were, were less consequential. Uh, uh, that, that the, the Gingrich uh, leadership uh, effectuated. And then I would argue, uh, not surprisingly, that we had another important series of reforms in the Pelosi era, um, uh, where we passed the uh, honest leadership open government uh, reforms having to do with the revolving door. We changed travel rules. Um, we required earmarks to be made far more transparent. Uh, so that you couldn't simply airdrop, uh, airdrop them into uh, conference bills or into, into the floor. Um, and I guess the point I would make about all of these periods of reform, as well as uh, earlier eras, uh, such as the progressive era, is they all appear in, a, in a, an era of crisis. Um, they don't appear, as, as Francis alluded to, because uh, the Congress, uh, or the public for that matter, arrived at some consensus about uh, the need for politics to operate in a more effective, a more efficient, a more responsive and representative way, but because of the sense that there was a significant breakdown uh, in, in, uh, in governance. I think the other thing that's interesting is that all three of these periods occurred during periods of divided government. Uh, and and uh, we had a Republican president and Democratic Congress in the 1970s. We had the reverse in the 1990s, and we had a Republican president and a, and a Democratic Congress in the, in the 2007-2009 period when most of the Pelosi era reforms, the so-called 6 for 06 reforms, were implemented. And I think that that's worth noting because it may illustrate that uh, reform works best when there is some collaborative sense possible in governance as opposed to um, the more heady but um, uh, more difficult uh, ba effort to balance when you have political power so heavily accumulated in, in one hand. I, and I'll close just by saying, um, uh, because I think we'll get on to some other issues in the, in the discussion, um, I've, I put a heavy emphasis onto this issue of civic education. I really have some huge skepticism about empowerment of the public um, at a point where the public is so 
grievously uninformed about basic political values um, and, and basic political goals. Uh, and we all know the famous story of the people demonstrating against the Affordable Care Act with the sign, uh, keep the government off out of Medicare. But that's really illustrative of, of, of and, and I don't say this in, a, in, an, in an arrogant sort of a way, but uh, to some extent the political issues that we contend with today are extraordinarily complicated. And the other piece of it that makes them so complicated is that we have empowered through a series of political and economic and statutory and judicial decisions, many, many more political players who are well financed and politically interested and engaged, uh, not always in the most constructive ways. And, and uh, the, the, the pluralist approach, which envisions multiple players, almost a Madisonian idea of factions constantly battling with each other and coming together, is admirable. I have questions about how it works in an era where power is, is very disseminated, which is good, but it's also captured by special interests and well-financed and partisan interests, which do not necessarily share the commonality of objectives that one might seek when you're trying to reach um, uh, reform that, that, that enable both, ref reform both in, in terms of the congressional operations and in terms of the society on a, more, on a broader basis. I guess I would say first, uh, Bruce's book, I help you all up. If you haven't read, you really should. It challenged a lot of my assumptions. I'm probably the person here who spends the least time reading political science data in the first place as a kind of working journalist, and that's probably unfortunate. But Bruce challenged a lot of my assumptions. And I think the first thing I wanted to say was I think that a lot of the assumptions that we have about small, small donors being not very good, lobbyists being bad, primaries being challenging, public comment and more public accountability being good, those, are, those, those assumptions are all embedded in much, and I would say almost 100% of the media coverage about how politics is consumed to the point where the President of the United States regularly assumes, you know, complains about primaries and gets, I would argue, political science wrong himself because he's consuming the same amount of political data we are and that we're producing in the media. And so I think the first reform that maybe can happen out of this is um, people like me can start really, you know, thinking about these assumptions and thinking, are our assumptions wrong and covering politics in a better way. In the same way that I think there's a lot of data, there's a lot of research now about how um, primaries work and they show that if you, it's much better to follow the, the, how the, the presidential primary process, if you follow who gets endorsed the most, that's a much more useful metric than what the polls show, for example. There's a book called The Party Decides that describes this in some amount of detail. And I would say that you can see a lot of journalists now are thinking about how do I cover the process not through which, you know, polls in February the year before are almost valueless, like have no predictive value. On the other hand, like if you keep track of like who the endorsers are, if you followed last week, Mitt Romney was leading in the polls and decided not to run. That was not an accident. If you, if you read our coverage in the, in the news media, you would be confused by that. Well, the polls show he's ahead. If you read political science research, you would, you would know that, oh, everyone who used to support him is supporting Jeb Bush. He caught the hint and he's out now. And there's, a, and there's an assumption there that I think is useful that we in the press should to some extent look more carefully at what does the data show and not have these assumptions about political reform. Because in the press, our view is almost always that more accountability and more things happening in public are good. And in fact, those things are maybe not the case. And I would, um, the second thing I wanted to add as an example of that is I would argue that, um, that I've been working on this project for a while here at New America about um, basically the idea that every state needs to have a New York Times or a Texas Tribune or a ProPublica, some kind of really strong newspaper that is, that is less focused on hits and more focused on, to some extent, covering government and civics very carefully. The way the New York Times does for the country on some level, he has something like that in each state. Bruce's book definitely made me challenge that assumption and think about that more carefully. Is the answer to more, most of our problems to have more public accountability and more public discussion? It might depend on how those papers are constructed because you could argue newspapers could be a good meeting, meeting institution and maybe that can work, but I would argue that I'm thinking about that assumption more as we look at the fact that things happening in public, we, we, we journalists love things happening in public. It's not clear that they actually help the process or help the governance process. Um, but to contradict that point a little bit, I guess one, and to make the last point I wanted to make is that one example of, I argue, sort of the, a bill that was done in the way, or a legislation that was done in the way Bruce, I think, is talking about was uh, something called Common Core. 
where it wasn't like something Obama proposed in Congress and it wasn't part of our congressional process. It was really written by experts, produced by experts, and the education people in the education field think that Common Core is a pretty good idea. The problem is, and I argue it's written in a way that was I, I thought was pretty smart. It was not written like Obamacare. It was written by the experts and it was done by states and it's bipartisan. And you're now seeing the political process kill Common Core. So, it, so again, you have to look at, so my assumptions again are in general, I think the way Common Core was written was a smart way to do it. But again, I'm not sure what reforms we can address to get, kind of get beyond our problems of sort of what I call hyperpolarization. So. Great, thank you. Bruce, do you want to comment on? Uh, yeah, let me just to throw a few comments. Um, first of all, there's always, uh, and I saw this first at a Hewlett meeting we had about a year and a half ago where we brought a bunch of political scientists together. And there was an older group of political scientists, which was about three quarters of the crowd and a quarter that were younger. And uh, there's no question that uh, a lot of the older political scientists thought that we were in a worse place than we had been uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Now, of course, that's not completely true. We are in a better place in certain. But I think it's important, and you, you mentioned this business about earmarks. First of all, that's not a proposal in my book. Uh, I did make the observation that it's hard to tell a difference between um, corruption and uh, parochial legislation and earmarking that's all on a continuum. And, uh, and the honest answer is in politics, and particularly a pluralist system like this, it, uh, it w operates on a system of legalized bribes, basically. Right? That's how it operates. You're, you're basically trading goods all the time. It's just we, we define that the good has to be beyond the good for a given individual. That we regard as completely and obviously corrupt. So if I have a bill that, you know, that is only benefiting Francis, that's the narrower it gets, the more likely it is corrupt. The one that benefits everybody in the room is more likely obvious, but then all along the continuum, there are these difficult choices you make as to what legalized bribery you're going to allow in the legislative process in order to motivate people to vote for them. And I know both of you guys know about that because you've been in Congress. So, uh, but that wasn't one of my, I have lots of proposals in my book that have nothing to do with earmarking. I have proposals about election administration, which is an area where I say, to be honest, we have too little democracy. We, we have partisan election officials, which is ridiculous. No other democracy does that. Um, I, t you know, I, I have uh, proposals about disclosure, my proposal of semi-disclosure that really we in political science don't believe the identity of donors really matters to voters, but what matters is what are the interests are, so why don't we treat disclosure like <laughs> census data and, uh, you know, and say, okay, uh, you know, this person is supported largely by the insurance companies, this person by the trial lawyers, that's all voters need to know. So you know, wh why, when we take something that doesn't obviously corrupt, do we have to re reveal the identity? Why do we treat small donations any differently than we do the vote? And particularly in an era when privacy can be so violated by, uh, by the internet and by um, what we've seen in uh, various instances related to our propositions in California. You know, I, I have, but the thing that I, you know, particularly if we're talking about Congress, we need to spend more time thinking about how do we incentivize negotiation in this highly polarized period. And, you know, again, take a world I know very well, redistricting. You know, we've opened it up to the public comment period. And so, uh, you know, we've got these commissions now that take thousands of comments. Well, first of all, they get overwhelmed. They don't know what to do with all the comments. Secondly, what's, what's the comments? The comments keep repeating themselves over and over again because there's no incentive to the people out there uh, in the public to actually form coalitions and negotiate. And so we should be thinking about, well, how do you negotiate that? Well, New Jersey has a commission system which does that, and it should be adopted by the other commissions. So there's a, you know, I talk about that. I mean, I talk about how we have to worry about making sure that there's balance in the lobbying, that there just isn't one side that's lobbying. And there have been various proposals by Heather Gerken and others about how public interest lobbying or, you know, tax credits for groups that need it. I don't know. There have been a lot of different um, proposals about that. I talk about storable votes. I have a lot of exotic suggestions in here which cannot, cannot be discussed or implemented at the national level. They have to be tested and tried at the local level. And the reason I wrote the book that goes all the way from the local to the national is there's a continuum there. And everybody here is focused on national, obviously, but a lot of work can be done at the state and local level to experiment. Okay.
Um, I don't have a lot of objections or uh, problems with anything that Francis or uh, John say. I mean, you know, uh, the reality is that I think we have very common views. Um, uh, you know, and so I, I, th I think the question that Francis raises, and it's sort of implied also in John's, uh, you know, a tale woe about previous reforms, is you know how how do you get them to overcome the in order to pass the reforms, you have to overcome the processes that you're trying to reform, is the simplest way to put it, okay? And I think both actually offered the answer, which is you develop, and this comes from Kingdon's work on streams of policy, but it can be applied to uh, political reform. That's a little academic footnote for Francis. And that is that what you do is people like us formulate ideas. Hopefully you find pilot projects out there in the States. They sit in the drawer. And then the next time there's a huge stink and a crisis and the actors have to act mm -hmm. and they have to compromise is when you insert those ideas into the process. And that's how reform always happens. <laughs> you, know, you wouldn't have had the reforms that brought John to Congress if you hadn't had Watergate, right? If you hadn't had uh, the milk producers and others uh, you know, secretly putting money in there. So you need the stink in order to have the cleanup. And that's just the way democracy works. Uh, it's and the Rahm Emanuel quote, right? Yeah. Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, well, that, that's, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. A lot of crises go to waste. Yeah. yeah. It's not clear that he was trying to reform the process. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I agree with you. Yeah, but he, he, underst he understood <laughs> what opportunity yeah. was. It's right. not clear that he understood what to do with the opportunity. <laughs> but uh, we'll leave that aside, OK? Uh, and, and then I, you know, I think on the media, I think that's part of what needs to be thought about and fixed, and I, obviously you're working on that, and that's really, you know, I think that's very important. I think that's part of the intermediaries that have to be looked at. There, the s changes in the media are some of the most dramatic things that I've witnessed in my life. You know, uh, the, the rise of local TV and TV reporting as an important instrument, and now increasingly being supplement or supplanted by the internet and uh, social media and the decline of credible reporting that's sourced with people, anybody can be a reporter, the over-democratization, if you like, of, of the process of reporting, right? Yeah. And, and then how do you trust that and uh, how it contributes? I think absolutely thinking about the media is an important part of political reform. And, and I think there are lots of serious people like yourself thinking about it, but we shouldn't underestimate how important that is to the whole picture that uh, we're talking about. Does somebody want to say a little bit, I put this on the table earlier, like when you say too much democracy, what does that mean? Or you use the phrase also. For yeah, instance, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, go ahead if you want. Yeah. I, no, I, you what I mean by it is that it turns out that both the too much and too little have the same problem, which is they sever democratic accountability. So if you have too little transparency and too little participation and there's no way to actually turn people out of office, that's the too little democracy problem. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that if you create so many opportunities that the interest groups capture it, or in some cases, and this is very academic-y, there are a lot of people that want to replace democracy with lottery, or they want to replace it with deliberative forums. Uh, that fortunately doesn't make it into the public discourse, but there's a lot of people in our field and philosophers types that do that. And we point out to them, you can't really have a democracy without accountability to voters. But there are some people that believe that. And, and also some of the people that believe in neutral expertise believe that too, that the courts ought to be making fundamental decisions about institutional design or policy. And you know, we're, we're about to have some critical decisions made on the ACA, and we'll see how well it works to have a neutral court deciding such policy issues. You know. Uh, so I, I, I think all those things, it's a severing of, of accountability, it's, and a part of that is you cannot judge democratic procedures without looking at performance. There's a trade-off between the process and the virtues of the process and then the outcome, that is, whether it works for democratic interests. Right, right. And too many political scientists in particular think only of the process and not whether it helps to produce good policy. Right. Well, I think that, to me, that's one of the big important interventions in the whole political reform field is like, how, you know, can we think of it also, not just in terms of the perfect form, right. but begin to look at, at outcomes, which is hard, you know, you, you also have to think about what you want government to actually be do, to be doing. So you wind up with some, it's hard to get away from some values in that. Anyway, I was still, still interested in the, 
Yeah, you, well, you, you let me give you an example from my, from my own experience. I, I've been on a tangent for some time, Bruce, and I've talked about this a lot, about the, the, the initiative process in California. And of course, the, the initiative, like the, the referendum the recall, were key components of the progressive reform of the early 20th century. And the idea there was that the legislatures were so corrupt that uh, you should give this more, much more power directly to the people to effectuate democracy. And, you know, here we are 100 years later, and would you find it's easier to buy the initiative process than it is to buy the legislature? Uh, and you end up, and I had this experience, I worked for only two members of Congress in 38 years, both of them were from California, and I was constantly dealing with uh, well-financed special interest groups that uh, decided that they were going to put on the California ballot uh, legislative ideas, in some cases constitutional changes, uh, that could never make it out of a subcommittee in either, the in either the state legislature or in the House of Representatives, that they would have some deep pocket who would finance uh, an initiative. Uh, they would give it a beautiful name uh, that, that, that you just wanted to tear up uh, <laughs> by hearing uh, and, and put it on the ballot and then come to congressional and, 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 and other players in the society and say, you have to support this because you support clean air, or you support clean water, or you support ocean protection. And my reaction to that would always be, that's an idiotic idea. I can't support that. And they would be indignant, because here you had the opportunity to completely bypass the political process and effectuate good public policy, at least from their point of view and their funder's point of view. And that happens over and over again, I think, in this notion that you can somehow depoliticize the process. George Miller used to say, you can't take politics out of politics. And I think that's the case. The fact of the matter is public policy making is reconciling different points of view, not obliterating different points of view. And that's why I mentioned this notion that we get reform, ironically, in situations where you have divided government, where people have to figure out how to make something work, as opposed to simply bully your way through and think that you, uh, you, you, can, you can achieve these goals by ignoring everyone else. I, I just, I really, uh, you know, I, I subscribe wholeheartedly to, to Bruce's point here, and that is you have to look at the end of the process. And, uh, and that, you know, ultimately voters are going to have to be engaged, they're going to have to be informed, and they're going to have to make judgments about whether or not people have performed correctly and, and effectively. You, you can't bypass that process and still have something that you, you comfortably can call democracy. On the, on the subject of too much democracy, I was mainly just uh, adopting uh, Kane's terminology, but um, but it's more of a California phenomenon than it is a Washington phenomenon. But where I see it as where I see the issue of too much democracy arising with respect to the Congress is uh, with uh, congressional transparency. Just I worry that members of Congress don't talk to each other anymore; that they just talk to the cameras. That that uh, and you know, roll call votes are being set up for the primarily for the purpose of communicating to constituencies, sending messages instead of lawmaking. And, uh, and, you know, and deliberation in committee isn't deliberation at all anymore. The, you, know, you come in, you ask your questions for the cameras, and then you leave. Uh, and so, so that's where I see it at, you know, somewhat an issue in, with but, respect to but Washington. Francis, you wouldn't want to, I mean, it's a, it's a choice to do that, right? I mean, you wouldn't want a world where roll call votes weren't open. So as soon as you have a world where roll call votes are open, you, you have that possibility that people do all kinds of, you know, the message amendments and things like that, right? I mean. Well, they began to arise after yeah. the, you know, after the liberalization of floor procedure that uh, right. John talked about. Um, but they weren't used for explicitly partisan ends in, in, uh, in the way that they are now. Right. Uh, you know, you had a lot more, you know, individualism in the Congress of the 70s yeah. and the 80s where, yeah. in, you know, individual members had their own platforms, their own issues they wanted to bring to public attention. But they, we were not enmeshed in the same power struggle that we right. contend with now where two parties are in constant battle for control of national institutions. Sure. I mean, it was much, it was, it was, there was a lot more room for entrepreneurship, I think, that you sometimes saw. And it was awful. I mean, there were plenty of, you know, when I worked in the Senate, You'd have people, you know, all of a sudden you had to run to the floor and vote on a Jesse Helms. I remember the great Jesse Helms Amendment. No, no gay sex parties at the Agriculture Department, okay? <laughs> you, you know, are you voting for this or against? You know, and it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, um, I mean, there, there are people who will do that. Um, I think you're right that the interesting change is, the, is 
going from a system that's a lot more fluid and where people like, like Congressman Miller really thrived in a very entrepreneurial environment to one that's much more tight. In a way, it's more tightly party controlled, well, partly because party and ideology are aligned. Yeah, I would yeah. just add that you know, one thing that Francis alluded to I think is key here, and that is that, that uh, you know, politics was different before the era of, of, of close political margins and battling for control. That changed that as much as transparency or I mean, the, the, many of the other things that we're talking about, uh, really changed the nature of politics and the day-to-day -day operations of politics. Uh, I, I remember back in, in, in the 1880s when Speaker Reed instituted a whole series of reforms in the House. He said, I, I, I've sort of come to the conclusion that it's better for one party to make the decisions and that's better to be the Republican Party. Uh, yeah, I mean that that and 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 uh, and so he made a lot of changes that empowered the Republican Party, which incidentally the Democrats retained when they took control of Congress in 1890. The 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 point being that uh, you know we went through a long period, 40 years, where very few people even thought about the issue of contention for for control of the process. Once you get into the point where you're fighting over control, as opposed to everybody knowing their place and sort of negotiating where they fit into that place. Then all these reforms become usable as, as part of the ongoing constant campaign. Because just as I had instructions out as, as Pelosi's chief of staff to every subcommittee, we're off the record here, right? We're off the record. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, every vote that happens in subcommittee, every statement that happens in subcommittee immediately gets transmitted to the campaign people to mm -hmm. figure out whether there's a political benefit. I think I need that job. <laughs> 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 it wasn't so, so um, you know, the, in, in an era where you're fighting for control, which is where we have been basically since 1994, and that has to do with the changes of the South, it has to, you know, there are a lot of political yeah. reasons that uh, happen. That's a different era. And all the liberalizations, the empowerment of special interests, the empowerment of, of, of PACs, and all, that all takes a completely different context when every day, there's a battle over who's going who's to end up yeah. in the control of the Yeah, process. Bruce, and then I want to open it up. Yeah. I mean, I think an important point that comes out of that is that, um, particularly in the United States, there's a great belief that institutional engineering can solve all problems. And I think John's discussion is a very good reminder that there are limits, even if you could get all the institutional choices as right as you wanted, there are still a lot of forces that are contributing to the contemporary situation that are just outside the control of institutions. You know, if you want to know why there's polarization in America, there are many different causes. Some of them are in the sociology of America, the rising inequality or the effects of dealing with lots of demographic change or uh, the social sorting or the party sorting. Uh, you know, there are lots of different things that are going on. And your ability to sort of regulate the temperature of politics through various kinds of institutional tweaks is limited. I mean, but on the margin, it can make a difference. You can make things worse or you can make them better. Yeah. Okay, we have a lot of really cool people in the room who have, that Ryan. Um, I kind of and introduce, introduce uh, yourself. One question I have is I have listened to the arguments about kind of whether or not transparency is making Congress a more difficult place to work is, you know, what is it about transparency that prevents the building of relationships? Because those building of relationships was never happening on camera. There are still back rooms and committees. I still see members of Congress talking to each other in the halls and I, I think there is a willingness issue, and I'm not really sure what that is, and it could be access for control or, but I, I can't see the connection of transparency and lack of willingness to build relationships. And so I, I'm, I'm, that's a sincere, I wanna make sure I understand that point. And the other question is kind of, how are we defining performance of Congress? Um, I mean, I, I look at John Lawrence and I think, I would love it if Congress could deal with, say, the Westlands Water District in California water subsidies, which seems like such a great example of an incredibly narrow constituency controlling a huge amount of federal money <laughs> that is not in the interest of most of California and the other 49 states, and yet nobody thinks it will ever actually be solved. <laughs> um, and maybe that's a high bar for performance of Congress, but kind of what is, what is the standard for performance of Congress? Is it 
taking action, taking good action as defined by what? So. On, on the point about uh, t how transparency can sometimes get in the way, I wouldn't s so much claim that it gets in the way of building relationships, but it doesn't make negotiating uh, easier. It can make it more difficult. You know, when you take, take positions in public, it's hard to back down from them or to uh, accept less than what you staked out. And of course, the deliberative process involves that. And, uh, you know, in, and to the extent that this is all in public and you, you're not engaging just with your congressional you know, compatriots, but you're engaging with the public at large, there's a tendency to use that platform for sort of gotcha purposes, where you're really not engaging on the issues as people who are well informed about the issues understand them. You are, you know, you're, you're, you're exploiting an opportunity that will play well for the galleries. And so those are, the two, those are the two concerns that I have with how transparency can make it harder to do deals. I mean, you're absolutely right. There's still lots of other opportunities for members to get to know each other, assuming that they're around in Washington at all. Uh, but it's the problem of do you have a space where you can talk things through where you're just engaging one another and not with a broader audience uh, at the same that time. Space not exist because of transparency? Well, you, what you're suggesting then is that uh, we th that committee meetings just be for show. Then that the deal has to be done somewhere else. Um, I mean, I guess I think it's back and forth. But, yeah. I, but I'm also it is really. Like I'm, I think that committee meetings have always been a work of art. So some of those side deals happen outside, of and some of those side deals you see in a weird committee hearing after somebody does a posturing speech, somebody's like, oh wait, I didn't know that one thing. And then you don't see the rest of the conversation. And, but you, you know, so. I, you know, I would just answer your question about the Westlands Water. That's sort of a perfect example. I mean, I've, I've been involved in the writing of three major water policy reform that did pass Congress that provided all sorts of changes in the operations of this one particular water district in California, which gets hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies every year, not only to grow things we don't need, to create, but to create this gigantic environmental disaster uh, in the Central Valley. And Here's the perfect example. What happens to those laws when they get enacted? They go to the bureaucratic process, which is not trans nearly as transparent, where there is no democratic accountability. And under Democratic and Republican administrations, including this administration, you don't get the, uh, the, the outcome which Congress clearly provided the opportunity to do. So it's, there's, you know, the, 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 the degree of transparency becomes an issue there as, as, as well, as well as political accountability. I want to get very briefly into this, how do we judge how the government works question. I think this is a really important question I've been thinking about a lot is, I mean, part of it is, I think, is in my industry, we have half the people believe in Obama, half of them don't. And so our tendency is to often say, this policy works, sort of, but its caveats is this. We might, I feel like if we shifted to a sense of balance where we might say, the ACA is working pretty well. Obama's ISIS policy is not working very well. It might, that's, that's balanced too, because we're evaluating the policy instead of saying both of them are working half well. And I wonder if, I think voters are often confused about how to evaluate which policies work, in part because the people they've sort of hired to tell them if policies are working don't always tell them, aren't, aren't always forthright about saying what's working, what's not working, so. Well, it's also, I mean, I think, you know, when you think about, we, we tend to ask, like, are institutions working? Right. And policies also are kind of a space that's a kind of institution of their own, right? So I'm struck by, it seems to me like one of the biggest phenomena is that there used to be a set of questions that had, you know, conservatives and liberals had different answers to them, but they agreed there was a question to answer. Right. Right. And, and so there's room there. So to me, the, you know, like education used to take that form. I think No Child Left Behind was one of the last, which is now almost 15 years old. It's one of the last great examples where, and you know, there are a lot of problems with it, but that's the nature of the thing, right? That's, there should be a lot of problems with it. One of the last moments where you had that kind of agreement on the problem, disagreement about how to solve it. And some of the, I always think like some of the deficit, some of the, you know, the obsession with the, with the deficit stuff over the last few years, part of it was like, okay, that's the last space. We all, traditionally, everyone can agree the deficit's a problem, we'll get that space, and now that's gone. 
as a, and that's you know I mean yeah. in some ways good riddance as an economic matter, but you know I think that's what people are looking for. And it's hard, even health too became and this is what you've written about a lot, Perry. Do, I mean, do you really think it's that bad? Have we gone that far? <laughs> well, I, I think it's hard. It's hard to find. Right? I mean, I mean, you've got institutions and issues matched together, and if you don't have some issues on which you can create the zone, I mean, I was you know a couple of days ago I was watching the. Uh, my old boss, Senator Bradley, and Senator Packwood were testifying at the Finance Committee about tax reform 25 years, you know, more than 25 years ago. Now it's fascinating. They were all like, well, they told great stories, and then they were all like, well, you know, you can't do that in a world where, you know, where all the members of one party <laughs> want nothing to do with anything that increases revenues, and all the members of the other party do. There's no, there's none of the zone that those, that those folks found mm -hmm. in 1986. And there are very few issues. I mean, there was a hope that immigration could be that kind of issue not seeing it, you know, there. So in a way, There's like, transportation where something okay. needs to happen, but it's yeah. running up against the same problem that right. you're pointing to on revenue or right. Social Security right. disability, where both right. parties seem to see there's a problem. Right. But there's a few things. I think yeah. John's right. When there's a crisis, there might be more yeah, yeah, urgency yeah. to compromise. Yeah, yeah. Might do it. Anyway. Yeah. You're on the mic. Well, <laughs> I'm John Starczyk. I'm a retired patent examiner. And when you're talking more democracy, less, I think the Founding Fathers warned against wh where we are at. And what they were against was universal suffrage. They knew that the mob would be led by demagogues flim-flammed. And I think the only solution <laughs> to all these problems is a limited suffrage. And the way I think okay, it, it, it is perhaps a fair voting test. I mean, you've got people now who still believe Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Those people have no business voting. Mm -hmm. You need to, and that's what the Founding Fathers warned against, and we've gone down that road. Well, if we get those people off Meet the Press, that would be uh, mm -hmm. an achievement in itself. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Skinner. I've been thinking more and more uh, not so much about how do we uh, reduce polarization, but how do we learn to live with it? And how do we learn how to build a government that functions well with two evenly balanced, highly ideological, highly polarized parties? And that's not that different from the situation that you find in, in Europe, where Europe, you, you've long had strong political parties and rigid party line voting. And I've also been thinking about uh, sort of the problem of the, the dominance of lobbying, and particularly the dominance of lobbying that is skewed very much to one side that happens to have the resources. And uh, looking at the European example, where you have strongly polarized parties, you also have really strong civil <coughs> service. And a lot of the decisions that are made uh, here by uh, elected politicians are made by career civil servants. And then it also appears to me that in recent years we've really seen a diminishment of a lot of the sources of nonpartisan expertise. And that could be anything from CRS to the less ideological committee staff on the Hill in favor of both polarized parties and of self-interested lobbying. And I'm wondering whether we should be thinking about trying to empower these sources of nonpartisan expertise. And here I'm not thinking about the courts. I'm thinking much more about the bureaucracy. Right. Okay. You much well, about that. I think one of the problems with that is that it w is that that there is, I think, a significant political ideology these days which is designed to demean the notion of government. I don't think this is sort of an inadvertent side sideshow. I think that that part of, and you certainly see it articulated most in the part of the Tea Party, but I think it goes beyond that. And, and there's a healthy skepticism on the left as well uh, that, that, that really drives down the notion of the legitimacy of government itself. And, and so when, you, when, when people complain that Congress isn't legislating, it's not being successful, well, to a certain portion of Congress, that's exactly what they went there with the intention of doing. They, 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 don't, they don't have any problem with an ineffectual uh, Congress or an ineffectual bureaucracy, the less public esteem there is for the institution of government, uh, the better. So that's why when I hear you know, suggestions of like, let's put more into the bureaucracy or maybe we should use government to do this, to you know, fund more in the way of bipartisan or nonpartisan 
activities, uh, I think it runs up against a, a, a diminished public willingness to accord that kind of power to, to government. And, and I see that as having political, distinct political objectives. But nevertheless, I think that that's, that's when, you, when you look at people into somebody, Bruce mentioned, somebody mentioned 16% approval of Congress is actually better than I, I thought it was. But I always tell my classes that 20% of Americans think that aliens walk among us disguised as humans. So that gives you some idea where esteem for Congress and for the institution of government in general stands. Yeah, so, I mean, figuring out the balance between neutral expertise and, <coughs> you know, accountability, democratic accountability is one of the fundamental challenges for any democracy. Um, and the reality is that <coughs> I think there are some areas where we clearly do have to worry about diminishing the expertise. And I, I actually think a lot of state legislatures uh, and, uh, you know, the, the making sure the CBO and various other agencies that provide neutral expertise are still respected by both parties. It's really going to be problematic if we can't agree on the numbers when we're doing budgets, for example. Okay. So there's clearly a role for this. But uh, one of the problems you have is that Congress does throw things to the bureaucracy that are still undefined and therefore political. And so if we were to try to define it as completely neutral and value-free, then you've got a real problem in terms of what happens when the bureaucracy has to make political decisions all the way down. And I see this in spades, as I said, in environmental uh, laws and the implementation of environmental laws where we basically have five or six great things we all want to do with no prioritization, and then we tell the agencies to go and try to approve permits for stormwater when stormwater impacts flood control, recreation, water quality, water supply, et cetera, and the bureaucrats don't know, well, you know, stakeholders are claiming they want uh, to restore the wetlands here, and they want to make sure the animals here are taken care of, and oh yeah, and then all these people that are at the end of the river are going to get flooded out if we don't do something. And so I, I think we're stuck, we're stuck with this blending process. It's been there right from the start. It doesn't go away. We're not going to have a system that has no neutral expertise. We've already discovered that that sucks. And we can have a system in which, you know, uh, there's too much of uh, the expertise. Like, you know, we can't move to a, the European Commission because then you have a democratic deficit. You have a bunch of people making decisions and, and people not vested in those decisions are thinking they're accountable. So we're stuck. We're stuck in making trade-offs and trade-offs are uncomfortable and trade-offs are problematic. And the system that we have was devised for a period, uh, at least a lot of our rules, uh, had a period from, uh, uh, from World War II to about the 1960s where we benefited from the fact that there was more bipartisanship because of the war, because there was more consensus, because there was less inequality, because we had shut off immigration. And so, you know, we, we, we didn't have to deal with so many different cultural challenges, which is a good thing, but still problematic, you know, not easy to do. And, uh, and now we're in a period where the institutions, some of the informal institutions that we had in that period, like the use of the filibuster, et cetera, they have a different meaning in this new setting. And so the question is, a democracy, uh, a lot of our institutions were, that were designed for the good times, do they work in the bad times? Mm -hmm. That's really the question. But the filibuster was a disaster in the bad times. Yeah. The filibuster was No, I, know, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. But uh, uh, there are times when the filibuster seems sensible. Oh, yeah. Because you're asking people to actually make compromises. But if they don't right. make the damn compromises, then it doesn't seem right. so sensible. Right. I mean, this is a system that's very, I mean, our political system is very diffuse, lots of veto points, checks and balances, it normally requires super majorities to do anything. And when you've got two evenly matched political parties, neither party has sufficient power most of the time to do anything. And so, I, you know, I do wonder whether, you know, this system can work with two strongly ideological political parties that are evenly matched. Uh, you know, is it feasible? You know, we can point to periods in U.S. history that were like this. The 19th century was like this a lot of the time with, you know, two, two strong uh, uh, alternatives. But the government didn't do very much back then. I mean, they could spend a great deal of time in deadlock, which they did. Um, and so, you know, can, can modern government function uh, under these conditions? I think it's an open question. But, you know, I, I would just 
one corollary to that is that I think you can make an argument that you, you, we would do better if we had stronger political parties in the sense that parties are an institution that force diverse groups to figure out ways of working together. And what you have at this point is a lot of the power has been diffused out to non-political, special interest, ideologically driven, well entrenched organizations that intimidate the people in, in, in the political process. Now, it's true that the parties themselves have become more ideologically stratified. But the fact of the matter is that, and, and you know, we're in a period where this may not be immediately the case, but it's a short term period in any event. The battle for control is the battle for the middle. I mean, there's 30 or 40 seats at most that we're fighting over, and you're going to win political power by having some appeal to that, to that middle group. Um, and if the political parties are not an institution that can, that have the internal discipline uh, to, to uh, force political uh, decision making, and instead we've, 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 uh, you know, we've, we've shuffled that off to ideologically driven media and PACs and special interest organizations and deep pockets, it's much harder to find consensus. Let, the let's get yeah. one qu one more question, but not but somebody else like yeah. like Jacob in the back, and then we and then we can wrap up. Sorry. Uh, Jacob Harold with GuideStar. Uh, my question is about the business community. Um, what is it going to take to get the business community engaged in this set of questions? There's no doubt that a lot of individual businesses uh, gain advantage from the asymmetries and inconsistencies and inefficiencies we've talked about. But in general, an effective political system is good for the economy, which is good for business. And so how can, we, how can we engage the business community? And in particular, are there any lessons to be learned from the governance crises in California um, and the way the business community at least seemed to start to engage in those processes in California? And, and is there a way to take that uh, to the national stage? Well, actually, I mean, the business community has been a leader of political reform in California. Um, the uh, uh, the changes in the budget process we had a, a basically required a two thirds vote to uh, pass a budget and that just led to enormous amount of dysfunction. Uh, they uh, they they were the ones that pushed the idea of a constitutional convention. But then when they realized, as Dana Milbank did yesterday, that the people that were going to show up at the convention were not unlike the people that showed up yesterday at the FEC hearing they immediately pull back on that. So yes, I think business has played a role in California in um, pulling back on some of the reforms and uh, pushing for this new initiative system. I don't know whether John's been paying attention to this, but the, the uh, uh, our initiatives now go to the legislature for 30-day comment to try to get more of an interaction, which is something business community and political scientists have been pushing to try to get the dynamic back between representative government and direct democracy. So I, I think you're right. I think the business community has to be engaged. They have to be the ones that push for this. They don't like instability in the political system. Uh, and they, um, I, I think, will be a critical uh, constituency to engage uh, if you're going to make uh, changes. None of you? Mark, you have I just want to thank everybody for coming. I think it's a fascinating, it was a, you know, the beginning of a discussion that I think needs to involve a pretty wide circle, really thinking about some very basic assumptions. So I appreciate the book and I appreciate all of you being here. Thank, thank you. you. Mark. Thank you.